Hello everybody, this is Michael Hollands once again for Sound of the Movies. Today I have the pleasure to be joined by John Powell. John, who has been one of the industry's most popular and best composers for years, has scored films such as Face Off, Paycheck, Ants, Chicken Run, The Road to El Dorado, Shrek, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, The Italian Job, Night and Day, Green Zone, Solo, A Star Wars Story, Three How to Train Your Dragon films, The Bourne Identity, The Bourne Supremacy, The Bourne Ultimatum, Jason Bourne, Don't Worry Darling, and many more. It is my pleasure to welcome John Powell. Hello. Hi. It's great to have you on my show. Thank you very much for taking the time out of your schedule. I really appreciate that. Pleasure. It's a pleasure. I just finished another film, so I'm. It's it was perfect timing. Great. John, as I understand, you had a classical training. Later down the road, you started working at Aerodel. You wrote commercial jingles, which Hans Zimmer also did, and Nick Lenny Smith. And, and eventually, you started working with Hans Zimmer at, back then, it was called Media Ventures, nowadays RCP, Remote Control Productions. And could you please walk me through the transition from writing jingles at Aerodel to working with Hans? The first thing I, I ever did with him was, um, I, I was a very techie kind of um, composer at Aerodel. Uh, a lot of really good composers, but a lot of them were older than me and a little bit more old school. And I think I've always liked technology and I, I thought it would be useful to be different. So I kind of invested a lot in a lot of equipment. So anytime I was doing jingles, I would be rolling out with loads and loads of samplers and, and sequences and things. And some of the other guys would just roll up with a short score and uh, something scribbled on paper. <laughs> you know. um, so I got a reputation within the company for being good for sort of technical music. And so it, I would, you know, like that's how I met Pat Doyle. Pa Pat Doyle had some shows where he had no, he had a very low budget. So he needed somebody to come in and help program you know some of the sounds and and uh instead of having an orchestra and then uh, i got a call from maggie rodford saying um hans is is going to be doing a, a rescore a very quick film score f to redo something uh over christmas um can you come in and meet him uh because he was asking about people to help so that was the first thing i ever did for him was this two weeks of madness and I wasn't even writing for him I was helping another person write who was on paper but needed a hands wanted it all programmed into his sounds so I that's what I would do and I just remember working very intensely over Christmas I think I had two hours off on Christmas morning that was it the rest of the time was just you know because I think we were recording the 3rd of January I think we started on the 23rd of December and 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 started recording the third of second of January I think um, and uh, so I, I helped out on that and he got to know me then and then he would ask me in for other things like they were doing some vocals on um, on uh, Lion King and in London and while they were there they want he wanted to just have somebody with all the sounds and sequences ready to go for that song just in case we needed to change something so i would t i never did in the end they just did it straight onto tape it was fine uh, but i got to know him a few times like that and uh, and then he said basically you know if you if you want why don't you come to america because we've got a lot of work there <laughs> you know and he was talking about media ventures at the time and you know they had the rock and they had lots of things that he couldn't do and he was getting nick lenny smith to do and even even nick needed help and that's when harry was out there and and you know uh, there was a variety of people helping and so he suggested that and eventually i i i did go um and it was about six months eight months later i think after he'd said it and uh, I may have left it too long because uh, I walked into his room and he looked at me and he had that blank stare on his face like, who the fuck is this? <laughs> but it, he did remember and then and then I was off and running. There, so okay, Great. Thank you, John, for elaborating on that. And the next question, I'm sure you get a lot, but I would like to go into detail if you don't mind. I mean, many people seem to have a tough time really breaking into this industry and Somebody once told me there isn't the proper infrastructure in this industry 
as to how to get a job. So they have a trouble getting an agent because they don't have a track record. They don't have a publicist yet. They don't have the experience, but the talent. So how did it, how did it all happen to you? Do you find, do you find it vital to get an, to get an agent or is it more about connections really at, at the beginning? Um, I don't think an agent is the first thing you should think about, but obviously I got, I had a connection. I had the best connection in the world. And the truth is knowing hands meant that I technically, my technical level just went up above everybody else's. So I got an advantage from that. And then also my understanding of working for film went up massively just by hanging out with him and him, you know, interacting with me. Um, and that's, and absolutely invaluable. So I can't really speak very well for other people because I don't know how I would have done it without hands, really, truthfully. I mean, the things I do try and tell people are, if you were all talent as a composer, you still also then have to either develop or be talented at the sort of the, the other side of writing for films. And that is a mixture of storytelling uh, and so, and good psychology, <laughs> understanding people and under understanding people who don't know what they really want because they're talking about music and music is is actually there so that we don't have to speak. Uh, it says things that there are no words for. We can project onto those, onto music what we think the story is. You know, obviously if something sounds dramatic, if it sounds emotional, you know, there's all these kind of words. But when you're writing for film, you are collaborating with somebody who is coming to you because they cannot write the music themselves. If they could, they would. Uh, John Carpenter obviously does. <laughs> um, so that those are the. It's a balance of talents, really. Um, and and that th that's the thing is that you know I, I've seen lots of really I I know lots of composers that who are so much better composers than me, but they do not have the right other skills for it even though they even though they're very good at working to picture even they they have great instincts and all this kind of stuff they may still not have the kind of the i don't know what it is it's it's the stuff that is about hand you know dealing with people it's the, it's the people skills yep. you know and so i wouldn't say that's everything and but but it, it certainly is a big enough part that i you know you can see why people fail and you can you can see them at, quite a distance. I mean, I've sat in rooms with loads of composers, loads of sort of student composers, and you can almost tell instantly who on the couch is going to make it and who isn't, just by three words and body positions, really, you know. Yeah, I think body language is important. And also to be a people person, to have social skills and to be able to meet people halfway and to read them properly properly you know if, if, if that makes sense so musical skill to, or to be musically skilled is one thing but to be able to understand filmmakers and also know about studio politics and the whole nine yards so to speak i think that's very vital too sure it's 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 not just sort of understanding this very specific business it's it's about being able to um understand the fundamentals of storytelling and why and who you're working with you're working with people who are who are fascinated by story and then trying to interpret their words and the film itself into something that works for them uh in the way of music and so you can you could be the most talented composer in the world or, or actually the a really kind of untalented composer and you can still make it work really well uh, either with e any of those sort of skill sets um, in the music department um, and and a lot of directors now they don't want beautifully complex you know sort of elegant music they they actually need something very very simple they don't need thematic re repeating uh, they just need tones they need color you know and that's that's sort of almost it so it's actually in a way the job has got a lot easier than ever I mean Hans changed it all because of the way he uses technology and now everybody expects that all the directors expect that there's no way of going back to oh i'm just going to play you the tune on the piano and then we'll turn up at the studio and you can hear it it's too expensive so this way is now the way and it's a question of you know 
are you a good composer can you use the technology or can you find people to help you use the technology but it's hard to get going if you can't do it yourself i mean who's going to have the the money to be able to get with somebody else I, i'm seeing teams of people coming in to the business and that's really interesting where you have people you have two people three people even where they have different parts of the skill set uh, i know i know some people who are like there's one who's a really good composer one who's a good engineer and sound and one who's a really good producer you know like music producer somebody who can really persuade and 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 speaks that language of um making putting the clients at ease and 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 extracting the right information and making sure that the whole thing goes in the right direction for them so in a way you know you if you're one composer you do have to be a bit of a team yourself on your own unless you can find the the, the right people to sort of uh, collaborate with uh, on it and some people you know that that's going to work very well for i mean i've been in teams i've been in you know i've written a lot with gam greenaway when i was at college uh i've written with harry gregson williams i've written with hands those are slightly different because i wasn't in those teams harry and i weren't in those teams because we were we we were incapable there any of the parts but it was really useful at that in those early days to see what harry was good at and what i was good at and i think it took us a bit a moment but once we realized oh i could <laughs> i could say to myself maybe i shouldn't do that scene because i'm really shit at writing under dialogue and harry just is great at it so maybe you just do that one <laughs> there was a couple of times on chicken run where i had a three or four goes at one scene and I never got it right. And, and he just walked in and in five minutes had done it, you know, so, uh, but there were other scenes that he was very, he was very relieved. He wasn't having to kind of do because they were just too outside what he was comfortable with. So we both grew up using our sort of preferred skills, but we obviously had a lot of the skills overlapping. Great. And thank you very much, John. And your collaboration with Harry Craigson Williams, is great. I mean, you've done Ants, Shrek, and Chicken Run. Apart from friendship and a good rapport, I think a certain amount of competition may also help a collaboration. As you may feel, oh, he has done really, he has done something really outstanding, and I want to top that. Would you second that? Oh, totally. Yeah, I mean, the 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 thing that we did on Ants was Hans was supposed to do Ants. And it got moved earlier, um, so he couldn't do it. And then Jeffrey suggested, well, what about John and, and Harry together? Because he'd worked with both of us in different ways on Prince of Egypt. I was doing song arrangements and Harry was doing additional score for hand. So he got to know both of us. And he said, well, why not put them together and see how that works? And up till that point, literally, I'd never met Harry. <laughs> I didn't know him at all. Um, and we walked into that one knowing that it was a great chance. Obviously, we both wished we'd got it on our own, <laughs> you know, because we're film composers and we would, and everybody, all film composers would stab anybody else in the back to get a gig. Um, <laughs> it's very competitive. So, but we walked into it with that knowledge that we, you know, we were going to be able to bring both our sets of skills and theory uh, into this to get through it because we knew it was going to be tricky it was an it was a hell of a kind of opportunity and he and i would both basically both sit figure out tunes and then go back to our rooms and start to write but hans uh, would keep coming in and listening and sometimes he'd say to me i think you should come and have a listen to what harry's doing and we'd walk over to harry's room i'd listen and i'd think fuck this is really, really good shit and i think i'd understand oh hans's point is you better keep up to this standard and so then i go back to my room and i work harder on something and, and other times harry would come in and with hands and and they'd sit and they'd listen to something and then harry would normally kind of harumph and, and leave the room <laughs> you know um and so it's it, it yeah it's 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 friendly competition and it it was good because it does it, it all it was was about you know we have to both make this great. We've got a chance. We've got an opportunity. We've got a chance. We cannot sit back on our laurels at all. I mean, remember the the reason we got Chicken Run was that, you know, I would because of ants. And so it literally is. If you do a really good job on one film, you're going to get another one. 
if you're okay and it goes all right the chances of getting the next one are you know 50 50. yeah harry and john did it okay but what about but hands is now available for this you know so they of course they're going to use hands um basically remember that every film the director is going to try and get the best most expensive composer that they can afford <laughs> you know and and it it would be wrong of them to not do that for their film that's their responsibility um so you have to really nail every at the beginning of your career you have to nail every gig and and then you have to nail how you how you market that success or you know <laughs> to, for the next one uh, and then it it goes on and on and on and i wouldn't say it it's ever stopped i mean i'm still in a position where there's films I still get don't get, um, I was luck very lucky to get "Don't Worry, Darling." I mean, I, I, I think it was just a, a, a factor, lots of different factors all colliding where other people weren't available, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and I was, and I, I, I sort of fitted some of the, some of the scenario of what they needed for a composer, but it's it's never, it is never a sure thing. And now, John, we can't cover everything today. I'm aware of that, but I would like to talk about some of your touchstone projects and landmark projects. And I would like to talk about Face Off just briefly. I mean, it was your very first solo credits. Um, I mean, Hans Zimmer had worked with John Woo on Broken Arrow. And prior to that, John Woo had worked with composer Graham Ruel. And it was your first solo project. It was a major studio film, Touchstone Pictures, you know, part of this, a part of the Disney group. John Woo directed it, major stars attached. And how did you tackle your first project in terms of handling the nervousness and learning the ropes and just trying to make it through the finish line? How did it all come together for you? Well, it was a, it was a, it was a call to hands. I think they'd had another another composer and it wasn't working and they were running out of time. They only had about six weeks left. And um, and so they called hands and said, are you available? And he said, no, I'm not, but I know somebody who could do it. And I'd just been working on another film with hands and Terry Malick. A, a, um, endurance. Endurance, yeah. So I think I'd at that point I'd impressed hands enough with my writing abilities that he thought of me, you know, and that was the amazing thing was that, you know, that's where he was the best agent. You know, I didn't have an agent get me any of these things. It was all hands. <laughs> so hands says to them, yes, I, I'll guarantee that it works. Um, you know, it's, it's now something we quite expect from, you know, groups of composers sometimes where, you know, it's either lower budget or there's just no time for the main composer to do it. Uh, and I think, what they knew was that Hans would come in and write if they didn't like my themes he would write themes and 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 sort of make sure it all worked and that's you know partly what happened I spent a week with the first four scenes that they gave me and I wrote themes uh, and then we had a meeting on a Friday and and they liked all the themes I, I think they thought Hans had written them <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, that was okay it didn't matter and then so I got the gig and then I had a sh rather short amount of time. And then that's when I can't tell you how important it was to have hands coming in there and spotting it for a start in, in the conversation of spotting. And then also as I started to write, you know, I mean, obviously that first week of me writing demos, you know, was everything. And, I, and hands didn't really give me a lot of uh, oversight on that. I mean, he he did, but not as much as then when we got to actually doing the film. Once we were up and running, you know, he would come in and and he would, you know, he he would be very encouraging on some things and other things he would say. I think you're going to get into trouble there. Um, and sometimes um, I didn't fix it enough, and I did, so I got to see <laughs> what he meant. And other times he was absolutely right. And other times I figured something else out that worked. So it was a real, you know, it was six weeks of, of growth for me as a composer and as a film composer, uh, understanding it. I mean, I didn't, I didn't get to go to any of the orchestral sessions uh, until the last day. That's how kind of, uh, you know, intense it was. Gavin Greenaway was there at the, at the time, my very good friend, and he, he helped 
we had so much music to do it was just endless it was wall to wall music um i mean and, and i i think i got the themes right by making them very emotional making them not outside the language that they would have had if hands had done it um but you know it it's similar enough to hands but i think it has you know things about it that he would never do and the great thing about hands is that he loves working with other composers that won't do what he does he finds it very stimulating i think and i think that's one of the reasons he always liked me believe it or not um the cue i played the most of all the cues that you've written actually is a part of face off i mean it's, it's called uh, this ridiculous chin face off has always had a special place in in, in my heart um, i love the film I think it's one of the the best action films of the 90s. I know it was your first solo score, but I also think it's it's one of your best because when I I've I've, I've rewatched the film just a couple of days ago and just the marriage of music to picture and the emotion that comes across, you know, the main title for instance or the operation scene or when John Travolta returns at the end when he walks around the, the, the patio and his wife opens the door. So, I mean, to me, that's really emotional and great film scoring. <laughs> Thank you. The opening title to Face Off was always going to be uh, a song until <laughs> about a, a week before the, until we were finished. And then I, I had to go back and score that, uh, <laughs> you know. Um, and so that was quite a complex sort of thing to do last minute. But, um, you know, it... It was, I think it was a, I'd got to the point with understanding my tunes that I really knew how to use them by then. So um, that's probably why it works better. I mean, that's one of the things that's hard is, is understanding the film and understanding your own, your own melodies <laughs> and what they can do uh, and as you write them. And, you know, I was in such a flurry of just trying to get it done um, that a lot of instinct probably would have been kicking in. But, you know, guidance from hands. I mean, if I was off off in the wrong direction he would very quickly point something out to me that would make it all click again and and but at the same time john Wu was very clear i mean that was the great thing is i think that's something about second language is that if you're speaking in a second language which john was you have to find the words that encapsulate everything you need and he just kept saying more emotion more emotion and and he he talked about dance as well a lot and that was what really set me off on kind of a, 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 a career long fascination with dance form as finding the right dance form for uh, for the emotion of a scene or the tone of a scene um, and I think that helps me in animation and it helps me in action yeah um, you know so I you know people were very clear with me and that was a great thing if I'd walked into a, a film that was was had a very complex sort of paradoxical set of people who were who didn't really know what they were what they really wanted and I, I knew the parameters were where hands should have done it you know hands was inspired by Morricone <laughs> and you know I'm inspired by both of these guys and John wants more emotion and he was a dancer and a choreographer himself and so I'm going to treat it like a ballet where I'm inspired by Morricone and Hans. That's really what I think I was doing. You just mentioned you had to write the main title rather quickly. And speaking of writing quickly or having to write quickly, um, The Born Identity is another example of just that, I think, because back then um, poor Carter Burwell didn't make it and he was taken off the project and Doug Lyman directed the film. How much time did you actually have to to finish or to deliver the whole score? I, I you know, every, for some reason or other, and maybe I set this going, but uh, it, when I look back on it, I remember it being quite relaxed. So it, it was, partly was, uh, I had a couple of weeks to write things before I got the job, almost. You know, again, it was like auditioning. Um, I had a conversation with Doug Lyman over the phone um, and then I wrote for a couple of weeks. I wrote a bunch of things, not to picture. Uh, and I sent, him, sent them to him based on what I thought was what he was describing. 
and I got lucky. I just I was deliberately trying to not sound like anything. I, I knew that they'd already used an orchestra with Carter, and it it wasn't working. Um, I knew he was trying to do an anti-Bond, so it couldn't sound like Bond. I knew he was an indie film maker who had just been given a bigger budget than he was used to. So, and I knew that he didn't like how action movies were scored. So it was kind of easy to see that there were so many things that I knew he wasn't going to be in into that I, there was a there was another area that I should explore. So I kind of went as far that way as I could, and I think some of that ends up in the film, but then some of it gets kind of changed. Um, but most of it, the thing it did for him was say, this guy's not thinking the same way as everybody else seems to be thinking. And then once I had that going, then I started to work on it to picture. And it was probably still about six weeks. So it was probably about eight weeks, which isn't that, you know, that's not bad at all. I mean, <laughs> I've done things in two, three weeks and, and that's that's very hard. But this was this was enough time to really sort of play with the those demos to begin with and, and and then get Doug's confidence on that and then start to put it in a picture. And and really the the only difficulty with Bourne was it all sounded very different from what everybody would normally do. It was difficult if it hadn't have been for Doug, I would never have had the nerve to do it. You know, it was if if it had been any other director who I knew worked in a more normal way. I would never have been able to sort of like take those risks. And and I wasn't even sure of those risks until after the film came out. I, I wasn't sure it was working really because it was so kind of different. When we got to the dub stage and it was very hard to dub. Uh, Scott Milan was the lead, you know, dubbing engineer and he's so good. He really helped us figure out how to make that all work because it was dry, it was small and it, it didn't work the same way that action movie music at that time was normally working. Things were just very different. The sound design, and within, and then the sounds I was using would kind of clash. And so he was very good at kind of finding ways of clearing things out and and making much more minimalistic music work. Because that's not literally nobody was doing that. I would I was inspired actually by more kind of '60s thrillers like The Ipcrest File and, mm. and things like that, you know. And also by the fact that they didn't have as much music as well. That was one of the things we did was not spot as much music. I mean, Face Off was 130 minutes of music. <laughs> and and in a, you know, in a 132 minute film and Born was a was was 100 you know, 18 minutes but only had 58 minutes of music. You know, so it was a very different approach. Everything was everything was different and if it wasn't for Doug, it, it would never have turned out that way. So Doug Lyman um, didn't return for um, the sequel, so Paul Paul Greengrass took over. He directed um, The Bourne Supremacy and The Bourne Ultimatum, and later on also Jason Bourne. And you also did United 93 with him and also Green Zone. And reportedly, Paul Greengrass doesn't want his music to be front and center. He wants or asks composers to be or to, to um, deliver a minimalist kind of score. And I'm curious, John, how did he verbalize what he wanted and how did you manage not to be on the nose with the music, but to still manage to make an impact? Well, the first Bourne I did with him, the, uh, the Supremacy, the second, you know, which was the mm -hmm. second Bourne, he walked into a, a, a situation where he was, he was doing his first Hollywood film and I didn't know who he was. And uh, Frank Marshall, the producer, called me and said, Would, do you want to do the second one? I said, yeah, of course. And I said, is Doug on it? He said, no, no, it's this guy, Paul Greengrass. And I didn't know who he is. He, says, he said, you should watch his film called Bloody Sunday. Um, and I did. I, I, got, I got a DVD of it, and I sat there and watched it. And the two things that struck me is that it was one of the most incredible films I've ever seen. Its ability to sort of dissect a period a terrible period of time and and the effects of bad decision making <laughs> was absolutely extraordinary which i then discovered of course was he was a documentary maker before this so but then also the thing that freaked me out was there was no music in it there was just a few tones and it didn't need it 
I never sat there during his, that that film thinking, oh, it's a bit you could do with music. Never. It was I was always engaged, always engaged, and that was what Paul was, is a genius at. When it came to Bourne, he walks in and he goes, look, I like the first one. I like what you did. I like what the editor did. I like what the you know, and he basically hired the same people. He was happy to walk in, and he just brought his sense of storytelling to the same franchise, and he f trusted us to sort of do our thing. Um, and ironically, the the score got a little. The, the second one is a little bit more um, expansive, uh, both both thematically and kind of orchestrationally. Uh, there's definitely more orchestra in it than there was in the first one, but he seemed to always love all of that by the time i was doing um some other films with him i really understood that now he was feeling much more comfortable with his sort of control of 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 uh, of everything you know he was never gonna give me quite as much leeway as on that first one <laughs> and i i was on united 93 i was able to find a, a language for him in that that was was very minimalistic and and he loved it you know he really he liked he liked it and that that was um that was a hard score to do but it i think it was just a it was about finding the right language and that that worked fine green zone was hard because the film was wasn't quite sure of what it was so that's always the thing is when films kind of ring true if you have an instinct and you can get your your sort of resonance of that it, it becomes very easy not easy but it, it becomes um quite a straight line sort of thing so as it went on yes I, you know paul really was starting to sort of really understand that he had you know he had control over his, over the music and and he wanted to try and get back to his roots and, and become more of the the filmmaker in a way that he was with his lower budget films before he went to Hollywood. So as he's done that, yes, he's really kind of finessed this idea for composers of, of how to do it. Um, and some of it I'm good at, some of it I'm not, you know, so that's why other people work for him as well. Uh, I, I love him dearly and, and I, I think he's an incredible filmmaker. And, and, but I do worry that I overwrite for him. I have, and I've got away, I got away with it in some, in some cases. And so it's great to see, him find people who really sort of nail his the style correctly for him. I did that last Jason Bourne film as well with him, but I was sort of out of action really for that. So uh, he was very very kind to me about all of that because I you know halfway through that I sort of was was sort of lost <laughs> a bit you know. David Buckley helped you on on, yes. on that project mentally, yeah. yeah, and Batu. The two of them never got through it without them. So yeah. Thank you. Dave, Dave took most of the weight on that, really. <laughs> it was great. So. Yeah. I see. You. Thank you, John. And of all the projects you've worked on, I mean, we are talking about more than 25 years of film music. I mean, you've done many live action films. At some point, you decided to kind of step away from live action a bit and focus on, on animation. And I think um, especially animation also features some of your best and finest work i mean how to train your dragon or robots for instance and especially the dragon trilogy you know constitutes um, a fan favorite so to speak basically and um, have you ever gotten a, a tremendous amount of feedback from fans such as you know this score really means a lot to me that changed my life that made a huge difference in my life can you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, some people, are, I must say, you know, people are very kind about it. <laughs> so like, they're very, very, and it, it's a bit, I, I find it disarming and, and I'm not quite sure ever how to take it because I know how much music has felt, has meant to me in the past, you know, and if I could say that to the composer, I suppose I, I would do it. And, and when I have met composers that I've, you know, admired a lot, it, it's it's kind of hard to, talk about because uh, I feel embarrassed slightly by it and so I don't want to embarrass them <laughs> um, some of them prefer it you know, they enjoy it more than I do but I get slightly worried by the the sort of the feeling of pride that you get <laughs> it's dangerous because I come from a sort of a, a background of you know brought up by lots of Scots who were Calvinists and you know serious kind of 
you know you you must not enjoy your life you must work always for god and then you'll be paid in the afterlife you know that's the calvinist state you know <laughs> and so that passes down culturally through the scots so my grandfather would always say to me you know don't dislocate your shoulder patting yourself on the back um so pride is a very dangerous thing and you know hubris um but also it is wonderful to to hear these things of course and but the other side of it is that because i've done such a lot uh, such a lot of animation and i guess i've been doing it a long time now i'm never quite aware of how old i am until i meet people who say oh that you're you're a big part of my childhood and i'm looking at them and i'm going I'm not that old, much older than you, am I? <laughs> but I am. <laughs> so it's a it's a it's a wonderful but double-edged sword sometimes. Yeah, I mean, you are also a big part of my early, you know, not not necessarily childhood, but of my my teens, basically. I mean, Face Off happened in '97. I was 12 years old in '97. So, uh, and I've I've been a I've been a fan ever since. I mean, I, I've always been impressed by by your work, and uh, I think you would have. All the reason in the world to you know pat yourself on on the back for for all the work you've you've done one of, one of the dangerous things i found is that it's like i tend not to do any kind of conversations like this or you know or talking to students or whatever else like that i try not to do it if i'm in the middle of a film because after this conversation i you know where people basically tell you you're very good at this and we want to talk to you about it and then you explain how to do it i then go back and work and I can't because I'm stuck and I'm, I'm sitting there. I'm going, why is this so hard? I just explained it to a room full of people. And I just said how easy it was. And why am I finding it so hard? And so it, I get into a spiral of kind of uh, sort of disrespecting my own abilities. And I have to find my way out of that. Um, so I, I try and be very careful about these moments when I can wallow in the pride of it and not and not and, and I can indulge myself now. But knowing and it's just because I've finished a film. Now let's talk about Don't Worry Darling and maybe if we still have some time left we can also talk about Solo or some other project and if we can't I'm sure we will we'll be able to do it down the road. John, Don't Worry Darling, I watched it again in the theater and I must say I was really impressed with the film and also the score and both the score and the film are more or less unlike anything you have ever done in your career basically and was that the main reason or motivation to tackle this project just to do something different it's always luck really it's just um it just happened to be that olivia had you know had a composer really good one and it hadn't worked out because you know it they shot the film during covid and it was just a weird time and and I think, you know, that other composer had started quite early. And you don't really know what a film is until it's finished almost. <laughs> it's it's a catch twenty two situation, you know. It's like when you look at a when you look at a film, you look at the score, the way the film works, when it's all finished, mixed, dubbed, everything else like that. I look at it and I go, Well, yeah, obviously that's how it should go. But until that moment, you don't. You literally don't. So I think Olivia needed somebody who could be, and she was determined to have somebody creative. So she'd had a very creative composer and she needed somebody who was going to be creative, but also I think she needed somebody who could, who could lead more, who could lead it a bit. So hence, I don't know why my name came up. I think um, just, I, it was kind of luck. And, and I was on a list of a bunch of people and uh, I didn't know her work and I watched um, book smart and I just thought it was one of the great films I just it was incredible I thought her sense of character and her, you know I just loved the film and, and how much I cared about everyone um, so I loved the heart of it and so I thought oh, I've got to try and get this so I I got to have a meeting with her and I think I got the gig because I could basically offer a, I, you know sort of like lots of different ways of doing it it's like well depending on how you, you know, I, I kind of offered her a, a smorgasbord of <laughs> of different sort of techniques that we could use, we could try, um, because I didn't know, I, I saw the film, but I watched it without music, without any temp music, and uh, and I liked it, and 
but I thought it was, you know, and I was honest. I, I, I said, I think this is missing this and that, and maybe we could do that. And, you know, uh, but, and, and one of the ways that I think I persuaded her to hire me was I was talking about Pina Bausch <laughs> and the music that Pina Bausch used to use in the eighties. And, um, and she, it turns out that Olivia was a, a choreography student, uh, at college. So she's, she, she knew exactly what I was talking about. And so I think she thought, well, okay, he's going to be quite creative, but he seems to be able to offer me, you know, guidance in a way that I, you know, I, she could choose. And so that's how it began. And I, and I, I sort of, I hopefully went through with that, which is try to be as creative as I could and, and unusual and try things and see um, her responses. And her response was, you know, was great. She would keep me, keep me honest, you know, and she would keep me creative. And, but she would also appreciate the, the storytelling aspects of what music could do. And even if I didn't quite have it, she would point out. And I, I, it's, it's funny how on every film I do now, I learn so much more. I really learn about acting more because she's an actress maybe, but I really learned much more about acting and looking at the performances um, and being really clear about when things shift in the actor's eyes or their face or their body language and, and trying to find those moments to kind of to shift myself. And so that you constantly get this significant shift in the music. And even if you're, you're not hearing it, which you shouldn't be, but you're feeling it at the same time as you notice as an audience member, you notice something about the humanity change, you know, the, the, the psychological change in a character. So it, it was a kind of a dream job. We did it really pretty quickly. Um, and, and it just sort of worked very well. Most of it was written to tell you the truth in about three weeks with, with Olivia behind me sat sat there all the time because I knew that was the only way that I could really explore all the things and, and show her and, and we could find things together. I didn't want to, <clears throat> I wrote some before she arrived, uh, a, a, a chunk of the middle and just to, as an experiment, just to show her. And I just ran it for her from, you know, about 20 minutes of it. And just to show, okay, well, this is an approach. And she liked enough of that approach. I think she realized that the film could be more, um, more sort of sensual uh in a way than she'd thought and and so that we went from there and it, it was it was just a sort of a, a wonderful experience from there onwards and and yeah it sounds different from me but to tell you the truth the crazy thing is it sounds a lot more how i used to sound before i came to hollywood um I used to do a lot of things like that with Gavin Greenaway and I would do very bizarre stuff uh, for a performance art group in London in the 80s and, um, and you know, and, uh, and art installation pieces. We'd do all these kind of stuff. Manipulation of voices <coughs> was something I used to do a lot of when I was at college. Uh, I loved playing around with that and the electronica. And so it, it was just, it was sort of, falling off a log a little bit it was very it was it was easy in some respects there are things about it that you know are i definitely did differently because that was the indication from olivia it wasn't it wasn't just a whim it was very clear to me that if i didn't approach it from a different angle you know i couldn't i, I was never going to be in the realm that she wanted the music to be in so Great, you know, strange and unusual was great. Um, simple was great. Clarity of storytelling was was great for her. You know, big orchestral stuff was not so great. We used a little bit by the end, but um, mm -hmm. but I did I did manage to <clears throat> manipulate. You know, a technique. One of the things I wanted to do was the the technique of taking, uh, you know, the way you 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 write for aleatoric strings. You know, which is normally creepy. It's normally for for horror films and it's normally atonal. I thought, well, what if we apply those techniques to, you know, very romantic chords? What if I can subvert the romance sound in some way? And so that was how it sort of began. I, I was I went to, I was in London just after I met with her and I, while I was there I did some experiments uh, in, with a string section in London. 
and and I brought that back, and that's part of what I was playing to her when I when I came back here, and and she she liked it. You know, it was it's um, it's more on the soundtrack than it is in the film. We kind of toned it back a little bit for the film, but it's this idea of of um, you know sort of subverting horror music, but also subverting romantic music, and you know and finding a way between the two of them. See if, see if there was a kind of a, a strange. Uh, you know, strange morphing of those two things. I must say, I really like the film. It's not a mainstream movie. It's not a mainstream score. I love the setting of the film. It takes place in the, in the 1950s. So I, I, love, I love the look. I also love Olivia Wilde not beating the audience over the head with the story. So it wasn't too quick. You know, the story evolved slowly and it made sense to me. And I was especially impressed with um, the briefing techniques which you used for the picture, and, and I'm curious: was it meant to fee Was it meant to convey a sense of fear, or maybe a, like a panic attack or shortness of breath? What was the main trigger behind it? Well, the the danger of it is to give it away for anybody who hasn't seen the film. But let's just say <laughs> sleep apnea and Ooh. is basically the original kind of thought about that and and then because i happened to live with the i live with the soprano she's my partner um i got to sort of play with her voice in a way that i would never be able to do if i wasn't intimately <laughs> involved with her um you know and if you've looked on my instagram page you'll see some very unusual things we tried um and it, it i so it was this it, I felt it was a very feminist film, um, and I, that's why I liked, liked about it, and I liked about what Livy was trying to say, and I love this idea of, you know, of, of, of women's voices being muted and being stopped, which is why there's a lot of kind of, you know, you know, the, her her breath being manipulated by somebody else. That's you know, a lot of those techniques are literally me playing Holly like a squeeze box. You know, just moving a rib cage in and out, and in in time and things. I just tried to sort of get that into a sound, and that turned out to be a woman's voice being clamped down, being made into these other things. But what was interesting, as we started to apply that in a few places, it was Olivia who said, "You know, this is this stuff really works as the. It's like a, it's like the siren sound for." The women you know so she actually used it as a kind of a, a tool to pull you and and as if uh, you know that was that was alerting the main character uh, to the possibilities of freedom what i find interesting is the idea of olivia wilde allowing the score to be used that way you know, I think many directors would kind of be quote unquote afraid of that approach as they tend to want um, the same thing or vanilla. I think it's a very unique score. It's not easy listening that that, that goes without saying, but it's incredibly effective. And kudos not only to you, but also to her for, for making or for allowing you to take that approach. Uh, this is this is one of the things is that you know in the same way that Doug Lyman freed me from so many conventions that I could fall back on what was actually a naturally kind of occurring state, the right director at the right time on the right film. I, I think you know it's it's a it's a great these are great opportunities for me to to try and really be the creative sort of person I always hoped to be <laughs> and yeah and and she was a hundred percent um the one who wanted and had the you know had the chutzpah to basically say no you 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 can i, I mean it, it's one of those things that she needed to see it and she needed to see it working for her to know that it would work you know and that that's so she's making lots and lots hundreds and hundreds of bold choices all the way through the film and some of them you don't feel bold because they are just so subtle and other times they're they're really in your face and that's a, that's an ex, that's why the Pina Bausch connection is is about you know is a kind of a 
a very bold statement and and a, and a and that can be very dangerous and very um nerve-wracking for directors because it's like why would why would they want sort of everybody to be really listening to suddenly how the music is oppressing you you know <laughs> because that's a that's a, a very deliberate sort of um statement that we were making there's nothing there's nothing in there's nothing in the film that is not doesn't have a reasoning behind it whether or not it all adds up to what you whether you enjoy it it certainly you know that's me at my most creative push you know giving being given a, a sort of a very clear um runway to land on by olivia you know she was not going to allow anything that didn't have a reason but when it really had a reason it was either had to be incredibly subtle or it had to be very bold and and it was just it's great to work with people like that and she's going to go on and make some of the best films of all time i'm sure of it and olivia didn't want to make the film the way that everyone else would have done it she wanted to make it her way and so i think it's more about that and female composers are writing differently and their mm -hmm. their, their approach to the work ethic is different because for fuck's sake some of them had kids they've had kids <laughs> they're not they weren't working while their wives had kids they were having kids and trying to work at the same time so they become different you know life becomes different they have a very different approach to thinking about everything thank god for that it's like so but change is i think change is good a lot of people freak out about it you know and a lot of men freak out about it so yeah. um, because they're seeing their they're seeing they're seeing everything change around them and, and they think they're losing power then they're not i mean for fuck's sake just allow allow the world to change a bit and you'll actually be delighted i think yeah that's very true and i think john change sometimes is vital and essential i mean you, you get you get this crap every time you know we have been doing that for 25 years or 30 years so that's how we do it we won't change a thing but who is to say we can tweak it a little or to, or improve it a little? I mean, sometimes you have to have new people come in or younger people with a different mindset, a different approach, and you can express your or you can express yourself respectfully and don't insult them, of course, but say, well, I think what you've done is great, but maybe we can just alter it a bit in order to go into a different direction to improve it just a little bit just to to go with the times it's important it's important yeah, that, exactly. it, it doesn't mean you have to scrap the whole concept no 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 not at all i mean really all that olivia did was give me you know uh, an encouragement and an inspiration that that's what she gives you um and then guidance as to learning the story, learning the you know why everything is there, and then it's really up to you whether or not you want to sort of use this opportunity to be inspired. I think, and I, I, I I've been lucky in my career to have some incredibly inspiring people to work yeah. for. Yeah. So. From what you've told me right now is that I think you've had a good rapport with Olivia, and it was easy to establish a certain amount of trust. I mean that's that's the the vibe I am getting right now. Yeah, it, it was. I mean, I think she had she she crewed out. You know, in the, my, making the film, I think she crewed it as heavily she could with women. But at a certain, and I'm sure she would have liked to have hired a, a woman composer. But I just I think what she needed for the film just didn't seem to be available to her at that time. Um, and as I say, she had another male composer, and that didn't work out. So. I just got lucky. I think it was just about timing. I was the right play person at the right time. And she also, from one conversation, you know, because you'd never expect, if, you, if you've heard anything I've done, and I'm sure she'd sat there many times with her kids watching films that I'd done, you know, listening to music, you'd never have made that link to it's like what she needed for the, for the film. But she was willing to have a conversation with me. And in that conversation, I think she understood that I was somebody who would who respected her and with that respect wanted to do something that was original for her and and you know and she would have known within two seconds when she first heard things you know and I'm sure she she would have been no it's not working thank you very much 
you know and and when it wasn't working she was very clear um and so i i just got lucky that's again i keep saying that but i just got lucky john the biggest piece of music on the album and on in the film was or is the victory chase i think it's in an eight minute piece of music to me it was maybe the boldest piece on on, on the entire album um, could you please walk me through the process behind the idea and scoring the scene and the whole execution of it and writing to the picture and i mean the finale is massive it's a huge chase sequence through the desert when um or after the big twist, so to speak, I, I won't give it away, but maybe, maybe you can shed some light into the whole process for that segment of the film in the third act. Yeah, well, the thing was that the section that I did with before Olivia got here, that I'd done just sort of on my own to, to show her some approaches, finished exactly <laughs> where that scene starts, uh, which is where um, Alice comes out into the into the world diff changed and um and so i got to that point and the great thing was that olivia said to me she said oh my god i want to hear what happens next i want to hear what happens next you know and so i right in front of her i just started to take some things and i said well, that we do that we'd had and we'd established i started to throw them in She had to go and go make a call so she went and made the call for half an hour and she came back and i had the beginnings of that whole thing going and she and she walked in and, and this is this is the beginning of the end she said this is great this is how we begin and it 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 was it was just really knowing that that was this was the step the next the third step you know so everything else was about teasing us up to that point and then it was like pulling back the bow and then sort of releasing it um and then what becomes very complicated about a scene like that is it was you know i I'd done, you know, 10 minutes of music, 15 minutes of music before that really quite quickly. And then this was really hard for me. It took me about two out of three weeks to to finish that that end scene because it just has to, it's about trying to build, you know, and you can't keep building and building. You can't just get louder and louder. You have to try and find steps and things. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was it was about just trying out things and then realizing it was too early to do that moving them around there's a whole it's it, it's pretty sort of technical sometimes writing music you just you you start here and you end you know you have to end here so you know how do you get there and and action scenes are are you know something i I'd, i'd done a lot but i really people always say well what, what's the inspiration for act for your you know your approach to action scenes and years and years ago i mean 20 years ago um, maybe even more than that, I, I, I realized that it's about arranging. It's literally the technique of arranging. And so I always use as an example the, the uh, barn dance from Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. And I've talked about this before. And people are very puzzled. And it's like, how does that fit with, you know, a ch long chase in Face Off or a long chase in Born or this long chase, you know? And it's it's about watching a piece of a piece of material being being manipulated into and changed in different forms, and then and then getting bigger and bigger, and then doing a left hand turn, finding turns. John Williams is the master of this, and people don't realize it much. Um, the the scene I always talk about is in Indiana Jones One, where he's on the truck, mm -hmm. and it's getting faster and faster and faster, and his character becomes at a certain point it, he almost is killed and he becomes more de determined and what John does and we are all completely used to this now but at the time I'd never seen it and it's just an incredibly elegant version of it don't he? he then slows right down and becomes more determined in the music <laughs> and it so what it does is it, it gives him a chance to reset for an action sequence that's going on and on and on and it just can't you can't get to a frenzy and then keep going up so how do you reset and finding the right time and the right reason to reset is always the trick so if you look at that end chase with the film it was about finding the moments to reset and where i could and where that would work okay. and 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 how i could effectively then keep 
turning left and going up again and then turning right and then going up you know so rather than be, it being linear all the time um so that that's the approach I, i've often taken with and with action scenes and I, and I i don't think it's really changed much but they're always hard i mean you know some of the born ones were really hard to just keep going is because they were endless and how do you keep them interesting that's 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 the the dance the barn dance you know the arrangers how they took bless your beautiful hide that little melodic thing and, and whipped it into these incredible versions that got faster and but they didn't they would then they would then break down to a different speed and and a different meter and they reset themselves in a way so that it feels over five minutes in that sequence that it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and faster and higher and blah 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 and it's not it's it's a it's like a barber's pole it's, it's something of a lo an illusion how they do it but it's one of the most elegant versions you can ever see of very theme and variations yeah uh, on you know it, as a kind of a linear form um uh, you know if you study it you'll see what i mean and you know and, and great action scenes sound like that to me very well put and i love the finale of the film and i also love the sound mix i mean the music at times was really front and center and it was a really good and bold sound mix and sometimes i feel like um the music was mixed in a bit too low i know some composers visit the dub stage and they go like well no that need you need to punch it up a little right here and uh, as far as i understand you try to avoid the dub stage if, I, if i'm informed correctly I normally do, yes, and there's a couple of exceptions to that. One of them was Born Identity, mm -hmm. and one of them was um, this one. Um, I went to the dub. I'd never worked with Skip Levesey before, who's who's a, a very famous and an incredibly celebrated um, dubbing mixer. I'd never worked with him before, and um, so it was quite hard walking in. I didn't want to, you know, because the composer on a dub stage is the last thing they need, really. It's like, oh, God, we've got somebody who's going to complain about the levels of the music and blah, blah, blah. And so I tried to sort of very quickly set up and say to him, I don't feel I've finished composing this score. I think there's still more to do to get it right. So if you will let me sit with my music editor and we'll keep trying things and to make it better, and we'll talk about it. And he was very open to that. And so he, you know, and 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 Olivia's got what I call golden ears as well. So she can hear and she can hear things really clearly. Like, you know, I mean, Skip and me and everybody on the sound team who's dealing with sound. This is our job. We do it all the time. But I was really impressed by Olivia's ability to be able to. What's that thing right at the back there? And you go, oh God, yeah, that is. Bit shit. I'll take that out, and suddenly clarity happens, you know. <laughs> so that those those ears between Skip and Olivia, <laughs> me and Bill Bernstein, the the music editor. I mean, that was the last part of the composing process, really, for me. It was on the dub, you know, trying other things. There was a few things we we moved around and tried to make work better, and things we edited to to work better and, and clarify, and and then the sound design, you know, with Skip and and sort of when the sound design would take over from the music and the music would take over from the sound design it was really kind of a, a very creative process. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, I think it's like one of my favorite dubs is, is Nightmare Before Christmas. <laughs> and it's, you know, it, it's a bit sad to say, but basically I think, you know, that required the composer to go in and, and run the dub. And he did, Danny did. And, and that's why it works so well. Absolutely well. I, I mean, I'm afraid that, without him doing that and I think it took quite a a big chunk of balls for him to do that and a lot of people were pissed off with him at the time it didn't matter because artistically it was absolutely the right thing without that approach in that film it would never have worked as well never have worked as well it's a it's a musical and he did it in this case it was just a bunch of people who had great ears and great instincts and we all just you know we kept going at it until it felt right that's all john what's actually next for you can you comment on that already um i never like to sort of say until it's out okay <laughs> because you never know but i've been doing a documentary and i've never done a documentary before and it's been really wonderful and really hard simultaneously uh, i can't quite tell you why but it's just very hard so it, again it might be a very different score for me um but i've i've been really challenged on it uh and 
but thankfully by a fabulous and wonderful director. So again, it's it's I'm lucky now at my, this stage in my career where I'm actually sort of attracted to the personalities of directors as well, because I think my responsibility is to work with people who need me <laughs> and and also my, my responsibility myself is to work with people who I feel are willing to get the best out of me because it's such a two way street. I, I, you know, I said this the other day about it's like I need directors to be my muses. Yeah. You know, they that, you know, artists have always sort of found a muse. It's somebody else's story or it's somebody else's kind of money uh, or it's somebody else's intention, you know, and, and they inspire you to create and you know that's that's the best thing for me is to have yeah. the right people and with the right project yeah. and i'll just keep sort of trying to do those would you say ron harrod falls right into that category totally yes i mean ron's one of the nicest people ever and one of the great directors to work for because he is so clear about what he likes and what he doesn't like you can see it when he's on the couch listening He dances and moves and bops around if it's working, and the minute it's not working, he suddenly becomes still and and pensive, as if it's like, oh, I did. So, watching his just physical reaction to the music is just makes it kind of easy, really. It's like, okay, I know that bit's not working, <laughs> Great. you know. And then and then he can back it up with why he didn't, why he was concerned there, why why it wasn't quite flowing for him, um, and so clearly it's just. You know, it's so easy. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, and some of the wonderful directors I've worked with have been fabulous. But you know, that that information is is five stories deep, and you have to dig it out by hand. <laughs> Ron Howard is one of my personal favorite filmmakers ever, of all time, and he has been described by many people as a truly as a true gentleman, a, re a really nice person, and a great collaborator. And you you've just confirmed that and. I really enjoyed Solo, a Star Wars story, and I think your score and your collaboration with John Williams, I, yeah. I'm sure you, you could go on for hours about John Williams, but I don't think we, we have the time today. Um, but allow me to say that the whole album was really, really, really good, and many people love it. And from a compositional standpoint, it was really something really, really good. Well, it, it was, you know, We, we walk on the back of giants and I was literally just getting a lift <laughs> on John's back on that one. Um, I had to make sure that, you know, I could, I could stand up and, and try and speak with as, as clear a voice as he has. Um, and that my respect for the original material, my respect for him was, was, was always there. But at the same time, do what the film needed and what the filmmakers were hoping for, and it's it, it really is interesting if you if you watch the kind of the how interesting the music got in Mandalorian. I'd like to think that it gave everyone at sort of at Lucasfilms, you know, this this work because I was I was nervous about doing things out of out of the language, you know, out of John's language, and 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 obviously John was a huge part of it literally there spotting writing these themes writing some cues um trying things out and encouraging me and and then the filmmakers once they really kind of saw what we had they and some things i would just do naturally um and sort of almost couldn't help myself to do and that those were the things that they were actually picking on and saying do more of that do more of that you know and i, I didn't i don't think i got very radical on solo because i don't It never felt like we we needed to and we wanted to, um, but I was very pleased. Uh, you know, I first saw the Mandalorian and I, I really loved the score to that because it was like, yeah, they've they've found a way of just going off into this uh, the, on on this angle at all. It's not you know, it's one thing to be st on on the Star Wars films and, and go very straight ahead and it and it always come out of Brian, John's sort of um, aesthetic and that works so brilliantly i mean mainly because of the quality i mean that's one of the things that you have to you, you have to understand is that john is just exactly the same as every other hollywood composer but better when you look at the quality of the writing at the micro 
you can see it and you look at the quality of the writing and understanding of storytelling from the macro you can see it um you know spotting was very interesting with him where he would run back and he would say can you go back and he'd watch it and he was listening in his head to what it could be uh at that time and so you know he would he would he would say yeah i think that kind of thing's going to work there and this, you know he had such a great oral inner oral ability that he doesn't need to try it out as much as i do with the gear because i have no or, or internal oral ability at all really um compared with him so he is he's better in so many ways he's like he's a he's a kind of a he's he's a genius at so many aspects of it uh incredibly sort of um kind and 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 you know and, and encouraging and but at the same time i mean he's a, he's a monster of the art in a way that you know it, the beginning on it was very hard they I, I managed to get all the short scores to all this all of the at least the first three you know numbers four five six uh, of the star wars i got i got the you know the sketches that he did which are incredible absolutely incredible and it knocked me into a a, a, a funk of not being able to think that i could ever do it um, I mean, it was very hard because I just I knew I didn't have that kind of <laughs> capacity um, to do it how he'd done it, and so I it took me quite it took me about six months to sort of just try and find my own way to something that I thought was honourable at least to the to the score, just trying ideas out and things, and and not not anything that the filmmakers had heard at that point because Ron was shooting and you know the other directors you know had had been shooting and everything had been going on so I, I i get to the end of the process when everybody's ready to go and john is ready to go with a bunch of material that i've had to sort of I, that's under wraps until until i heard john's stuff once i heard john's things then it allowed me to totally make sense of everything i'd written and some things obviously aren't in there i didn't need them i didn't they weren't working as well but certain things I could figure out the attachments between John's material and and the old material and this new material and and what language it, it just kind of helped it helped me make a decision of what the language could be if John hadn't been involved I would have had to make different maybe I would have made different decisions but it was the best thing for the film and that's why I kept I mean I I, I always tell people I only signed on because John was going to write the theme you know <laughs> It's like if they'd said, "Do you want to do this?" and I'd say, "Is John Williams involved?" and they'd said, "No, I don't think I would have done it." I really don't. It's like, okay, I need you know, because every time I do a project now, I like the idea that I'm going to learn. How do you want to proceed career-wise? Do you want to, let's say, also focus on concert music, or at least you know tackle another project concert music-wise, or do you want to? Do another an animated film, or maybe focus on on live action. How do you plan to continue? It's interesting having done "Don't Worry, Darling." I mean, it'll be interesting if I get calls for those kind of things because I don't know. With in the wrong in the wrong hands, I have no interest in doing it. You know, I only you know it was about Olivia. Uh, this documentary I've done is about the director, really, <laughs> and you know every other. I've got an animation coming up that's very much about the director um, and a couple of other things, you know, on the horizon for films, which are really about the personalities of who I get to work with and, and what they might be able to bring out in me. Um, but then the other side is, yes, all this writing uh, over COVID. One of the things that Gavin Greenaway and I did with uh, Michael Petrie, who's Jermaine, Pe uh, Jermaine Franco's brother. That's how I met Jermaine. Um, we used to work in this, installation art sort of um, world. Michael is a, an artist, a brilliant artist, and um, he's a great writer as well and all this kind of thing. And one of the one of the art installation art pieces he came up with was um, at Bonn at the um, like the National Gallery of Germany in Bonn. I'm not quite sure. I can't remember the something Kunsthalle, obviously, but um, and it, they had a even though it was an art gallery, it had a 350 seater uh, theater there so they gave him a commission um to do an installation art piece and he said could the installation art piece be an opera 
<laughs> so, and they said, well, you don't care. You do whatever you want. So we wrote in 1995, um, we wrote this opera together, Gavin and I and Michael, and, and performed it in Bonn with uh, a cast of four leads, um, about 13 musicians on stage and 12 uh, ladies from the Bonn uh, Opera Chorus came and we had a few days of rehearsal and we just did it sort of in this kind of staged manner um, and it, it was an interesting thing to do and it was the hardest thing I'd done up till then and it, I think I would say that that's one of the reasons that I felt I was then ready to come to Hollywood <laughs> and see hands um, you know the proof of that so one of the things we did in COVID was we dug it up because we realized there's no good recording of it and um, and we started to reorchestrate, rewrite some of it um, and finesse it. And then we recorded it last year um, with orchestra and musicians and some singers. And and I, I'm looking to sort of, you know, we're starting to sort of try and get performances of that. It was really wonderful to look at it again. And I, I realized that I've always had this love of opera and um, and now my storytelling chops, you know, my abilities at storytelling have got way better because of all these people I've been hanging out with in Hollywood. Um, so I, I think I think that's going to be one of the things I'm fascinated to do. I, I did an oratorio, you know, a few years ago, again, with Michael Petrie writing the, you know, the words for me. But it was based on a story I wanted to tell. And I, you know, there's some there's some other pieces that I've been writing um, along the way. And, and I, I love to write not for film because I think it's good for film as well uh, and it's also it's good for my sense of um, finding you know finding my voice even more make make music that says the things that I I loved about music and I'd like to be able to say you know uh, because when you're in film you are you're constantly working with a in a collaboration so the music has to say the right thing for the film whether or not outside the film it can say clearly what that was. And some people enjoy soundtracks because they remind them of the story in the film. And I think some people even like soundtracks because they, it doesn't. And if you, I've always been trying to write music that would sit alone and would make sense on its own. Um, and that's not actually something you need to do often in, in film music. In fact, it gets in the way. Uh, sometimes because there's two stories going on almost if you if you're not if you're telling too many details and you know overwriting is what it's called really ba mm -hmm. basically um, for film <laughs> and you know obviously I, I have learned to underwrite or write at the right level but I still have a, a you know a, a notorious sort of you know instinct to overwrite because I I feel the story and I just try and say everything in the music and sometimes that's great but when there's dialogue going on and, and it's really clear already and it's like why why are you telling the same story twice we, there's another aspect of this scene that you need to tell and that could be just there's not anything that needs to happen other than just create that little tension underneath and that's all and it in a way I should be able to do about 15 films a year if I did that like that if I approached it from just Nah, doesn't need much, doesn't need much, yeah. But I find that very hard. So I'm still back to one film a year at the moment uh, where I, I need to pick the right film and I need to write the right kind of thing. And it's the same with the operas. Uh, I mean, once we get this first opera up and running, then uh, I've got a couple of ideas for other ones that I'd like to really do. Um, and I, I, I do have one opera that I want to work on uh, that I think could be really, really interesting. Um, and that would be the one that, if I can pull it off the way I think it could be pulled off, uh, I think it could change opera a bit. I mean, opera is changing, thankfully, because a lot of people coming into the opera world that you know don't you wouldn't expect to. Uh, I think is it this weekend? I'm going to see Michael Abel's and uh, Rihanna Gibbon, uh, Gibbons' um, new opera called Omar mm -hmm. uh, that's getting its West Coast premiere in LA. Is it coming? I mean, it's a couple of weekends from now. Um, very excited to see that. I think Michael Abels is a brilliant composer, and, and she's a brilliant composer as well. I've always loved <laughs> her stuff. So that you know that changes opera, but I think also I think the storytelling that can happen in opera has not really. It's been incredibly well done in musicals, but never, but not in opera. Often um, stories tend to be a bit ephemeral, 
Uh, I mean, John Adams has done it really well in, in you know, in, in some of his, especially some of the last ones. But, but it does tend to be that operas can be a bit sort of, you know, nebulous and it's just about the music. I, I keep wondering, well, what if we had a really, you know, intense story? It's not that it's not there, but, you know, I mean, I think Puccini can be great at that. Uh, but Verdi and other composers, you know, it's it's so kind of, it's such a kind of a light, you know, nature that the stories have. Um, I mean, Britain operas as well uh, can be very, very clear about their storytelling. But even then, they, they tend to be a bit literary and, and part of that poet, you know, poetry of the languages can mean that the story is... Is a is a bit ephemeral, and and I think I think the logic that Hollywood sometimes requires for great storytelling, I think that could be really interesting to bring out more, you know, in an opera form where it's kind of like a musical, but it's not going to have a happy ending, and it, it it's and it's never going to make any money. <laughs> Those are the two things, so that you can really do things that you could never do in a musical, but they have that. And obviously, musically, it would be much more. Yeah, we, it's not about being difficult for the audience, but it, it's it's not. It doesn't have to fit into that kind of category of musical style, which are, are very narrow. They always have been. I mean, there occasionally you get these breakout things, and it's wonderful when they do. But r most musicals are, are, are built into a, a an expectancy that the audience has of the star. At least in operas, you don't have to do that. But even then, there's modern operas have an expectancy to be complicated and hard and you can't follow the story i think that's great we've experimented with that now let's experiment with it the other way and make a really tight story where it's absolutely gripping the whole time the storytelling is gripping not just the music and the music can accompany that in a way that that could be really um you know a a, a worthy sort of use of the of the of the amazing resources that are involved in doing operas, and, you know, because it's quite an, an incre incredible sort of idea that you have a full orchestra and you have a chorus and you have sets and you have everything soloists and and it it always seems to me the more I watch some of these other operas, not modern operas but older operas as well, how kind of you know how thin they've used the 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 resources. Because often it was about the stars and it was about the vo the soloists and things like that, and not even the story. It was just the story was just a you know a way of sort of making this beautiful music, and often it is beautiful music. And but I'd say, well, why not just do that in concert? You know, why have you have to stage it? Because nobody's acting very well anyway, <laughs> you know, and the sets are are beautiful and expensive, but without sort of this incredible you know what we used to in cinema this this level of acting and storytelling it's it's a it's a very different approach it's just beautiful sets people standing there singing and often very beautiful music and as long as you don't know what the words mean it's great you know but if you really want to know what the story is if you really want to sort of see see the details of the story being told and and follow along with it in such a way that you don't know what's going to happen and you're intrigued and more than intrigued, you are shocked and you are um, surprised and you are, you know, you feel a sense of tragedy. It's not just the music telling you that, but it's the story telling you that. So that's a long way around to saying basically that's that's what I'm trying to get to work on as well as doing some other films. Great. I'm looking forward to it. And John, maybe I can squeeze in one final question. I almost forgot about it. I don't know how well documented this is, but I heard that you actually worked on Armageddon before Trevor Rabin was hired and, and Harry helped out. I mean, yes, I, I worked on lots of things trying to get them. I mean, I did work on it. Um, you know, I did demos for lots of films in the beginning of my career, still today, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, things came in. I, I'd done Face Off and, I, you know, Hans was impressed with me on that. But I, it was pretty obvious that I wasn't necessarily writing the way that a Bruckheimer film would would like, you know. And 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 Hans gave me all the warnings in in you know in advance and and told me you know you got away with it on Face Off, but on this you'd have to kind of really kind of clamp down on some of that you know filigree that <laughs> that you seem to like, and you know. 
I tried some things and, and no, sure, of course I didn't get it. <laughs> Trevor got it and did a fabulous job, you know. And yes, Harry helped him out on that. Um, and I, but I was off doing something else. Uh, you know, I, uh, you know, when you when you're at the beginning of your career, you you try all sorts of things to to get gigs. I, you know, I I did reels that were really crazy, and some of them got me some interesting things, and some of them probably meant that I was never going to get jobs. Uh, I remember going for a, um, an interview in Paris where they were shooting a film. It was a Hollywood film, and and I learned very quickly. This was very early on, which is if you go in and you've read the book and you've read the script and you go to the set and the director is there <laughs> making the film and you have lunch with the director and you just start by telling them exactly how the music's going to sound, you have a 50-50 chance of it being great, this guy has already got an opinion, or this is not the film that we're making. <laughs> and I remember early on I did that and it was like I was describing all these things and and then just near the end of the conversation the director said yeah well what we're really looking for was and I realized oh fuck I mean it's not that I couldn't do that but I'd already sort of just invested all of my ideas in the wrong direction so you you live and you learn on each of these things and there's lots of them there's, there's lots of things I've written for films that, that I never got or films that then didn't exist or you know, I mean, one of the things I may do is uh, I'm, I might start doing like albums of music um, sort of for licensing and, and for, you know, um, use by people um, that is like a film that doesn't exist. And some of it could be things that for films I didn't get, some of the things that got thrown out of films that I did get, um, or things that I write anew based on this idea of a story that doesn't exist. Um, and I like the idea of doing that as well in the future is like sort of like film music for films that I don't have to, I, in, the, in my imagination and then we won't necessarily say what the film is or what the story is at all and then people can come along and they can use it and it would be a whole film score it would be three three themes and riffs and and every variant uh, you know that I would normally do in a film score um, going through maybe sort of 60 minutes of music that that you can see oh i can use this and it's got that theme and i can use this variant when somebody dies and i can use this variant when it's when when we realize the hero is going to win you know so uh, that's an interesting way of doing it and and i think that's you know yes so some of the things that i wrote probably trying to get armageddon are used in other things uh, but i also learned a lot of ways of writing for that that i realized weren't going to work for certain genres and were a quirk of mine that I could either sort of try and beat out of myself or, or lean into. And I, I think what I did was lean into it. So everything, everything about all the things that I wrote for Armageddon that they didn't like were what I've made my career on now. <laughs> sure, I didn't get that film, but I really wasn't right for it at all. Yeah. And well, I would have constantly had the wrong, in, wrong instincts, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, I had the right instincts for for John Woo because I think he's just a different kind of filmmaker, um, but but not for Michael Bay, you know. So. Yeah, I mean, thank you for for commenting on that, and I think the combination of Michael Bay, Jerry Bruckheimer, and also Gail and her who also produced it, I think that combination may or would probably intimidate um, maybe even the most seasoned pro. Oh yeah, you know Harry, Hans and Harry have done a lot of films with them, and um, you know, and, and talking to Trevor as well is like it, it takes a certain you know sort of approach to the job. You have to understand how kind of how blunt people are going to be, and Hans and I used to talk about this a lot. And he he's got a great sort of like uh, Babelfish translator of things that somebody can say that would kind of cut you to the bone, uh, that would destroy your confidence normally, that would that would really kind of make you want to run out of the of the room screen, you know, crying. Yeah. And he, he turns that into a positive way of describing it. And he, he did say to them at me, he, he you know, he said, you have to listen really carefully because when they say if the words are out of the director's mouth is 
this is the biggest piece of shit I've ever heard and you are killing my film, you're ruining my film, what the fuck are you doing? If that's what comes out of their mouth, what they're really saying is, I don't think this quite works as I thought it could work. <laughs> Maybe there's something a bit better we could do or d a bit differently, something a bit differently, you know, and that's just about personalities. That's it. So being able to take that sort of what could be considered to be abuse and, and convert it into what, what is it? The, really, you know, there's that, those comments are just an expression of, of what a director is trying to do to keep their film in the direction that they'd always imagined. And, 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 and basically just not reacting well to music is, is either something is always something that every director is going to be upset about because they want the music to work. You know, you play, you hit play, you, they want it to work. They want the film to work as well as they can. If it doesn't, their response is basically, this isn't working. I don't know why, or this is work isn't working. I do know why. And that's what, so that you know, there's a problem and you know that you have to try and try something else to fix it, whether or not they can guide you to that fix or not is it depends on the per person ron howard can but other directors are much more kind of vague or they're confused or they get defensive because they're they feel out of control they have a lot of other control in the process this is one that they don't have a lot of control other than telling you that it's shit you know yeah. and if you just take that at face value it's 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 really difficult if you can do that translation that hans talked about then it really helps. Telling somebody, well, what their road is a piece of shit. I mean, it's 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 abusive. It's it's totally abusive. At least in my book, uh, there are dozens of ways to express that more nicely. Uh, you know, there are definitely people I've not worked with um, who are famously nice, and and people I've not worked with who are famously abusive. Uh, and there are some people who are brilliant filmmakers that are difficult because they are. They're very short, sharp in their descriptions of music and what they feel is going on. And that, and that is hard. It's very, very hard, especially when, when they're people who you respect highly, you know, and then they're saying these things to you. And you're, I mean, I've never had anything quite as bad as that at all, but I have had difficult conversations where I've not understood how vehemently the music is reacting with them in the wrong direction. You know, I did a film once where I, I was working with a director who's quite difficult and and in the end uh, after about three or four meetings I my my agent called me up after like the fourth meeting and said um, I just got a call from your director saying have you got any other composers available and I, I said what do you mean and she said well they said if you've got any other composers it would be great and, and my agent said well what's going on with John then And, and he said, I, it's just not really working at all. It's not the way, it, it doesn't sound right to me. And so she said, did you talk to John about that? Did you tell him that you don't like any of it? And he's, and he said, well, I don't, I don't know if, I don't know if I really can. And she said, well, look, if you were calling me and said, who could, who could come in and write the score and keep changing it until it was right, I'd say you should hire John Powell. He's very good at it so just ask him they came back and 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 we had that discussion and it's like it, yeah, you need to tell me and I, right. i so then i tried totally different things and then bingo we were off and running and then we were fine and i kept the gig so what do you think is worse you know telling somebody well i don't think you're quite there yet and please can you tweak it is that worse than actually going behind somebody's back and have them fired you have to understand that it's it's a very hard thing to talk about me mm -hmm. it's like maybe they thought they had described things mm -hmm. but they hadn't been clear enough to me uh, as in you know when people come in and ask you to tweak something but actually what it is is they think it's completely wrong but they don't want to say that then you keep tweaking it and you're not fixing the essential problem to it which is I just don't like the orchestra or I don't like synths or I don't like this tempo or this harmonic style is, is too busy or this harmonic style is too basic. You know, it could be any of these things. And it's not, it's not actually a language that is very easy to speak unless you're in music and then we're used to it. 
it's like just from the beginning of learning music it's like good bad always you know everything is about how to get better how to analyze music how to you know see what the music is doing and see if you know you can do it better in a certain way and then you come across these people who have this incredible love of music and they're loving it if it fits their picture and it doesn't then how to, how do they need to deal with you they can deal with actors very well a lot of them are great at dealing with actors a lot of them are great with dealing with screenwriters camera people lighting the costume all of these things they is are simpler in language terms than than talking about music where one person's avocado is another person's tomato it's it's just taste and musical history and what you like and what you don't like and what speaks to you and the, which is the great thing about music it's so wonderfully vague that you can listen to a piece of music and hear a story that's that's a horror story and i can listen to a piece of music and the same piece of music and think this is a love story you know that is completely great music is like that and and then and you know so it's this hard it's this very hard language to talk about so as you know taught me very early very early on that you know it's a and maybe it's you know him working in hollywood he's got the biggest vocabulary of anybody i know in english you know for a german it's incredible really <laughs> you know seeing it's his second language and that could be why he's so good at it it's because he's found the words that he really needed because he's really looking for that language that e explanation language that confidence of of how to move forward with in with a subject that cannot be described john thank you so very much for taking so much time out of your schedule i really appreciate that i really do I had such a great time talking to you today and I hope you enjoyed the conversation as well. Of course, thank you. It was a pleasure. I really had a great time and take care, stay safe, stay healthy and you have a good time.